I told you that I'd be back this week. And you know what? I brought a friend this time. Courier Nation, welcome back to Season 2, Episode 3 of the Deliver on Your Business podcast. Now, let me tell you what this is not. This is not the Deliver on Your Employment podcast. My friends, as independent contractors, we're running businesses. That's what we are all about. We are here to talk about doing life and delivery, and more than that, doing life as independent contractors. It's all about equipping you and encouraging you to claim your role as independent contractors because the thing is you've got what it takes to run your business be awesome at your business to be the boss as you deliver on your business Okay, my friends, I'm going to keep this introduction short today because we've got actually what turned out to be a much longer episode than what I planned on. I've got uh, Steve Johnson with Ride Cheer Rodeo Podcast joining us today. We're talking about employee versus independent contractor, about PRO Act legislation, which is national legislation that if it ever got passed could really impact our ability to continue working as independent contractors. And let me just say we got talking a bit. And that shouldn't surprise me. Now, Steve's in Denver like I am. And we've gone back and forth quite a bit. I've been on his podcast, but we've never actually met up and gotten together, even though we're in the same town. So yesterday we got together for some coffee, talk about what we're going to do with this, and just kind of talk shop a bit. And we both thought maybe it'd be about an hour. Well, it wasn't even close to an hour then. So it shouldn't surprise me that we got going again today. But you know, my friends, this is an important topic today. Uh, this, some of this stuff, I think it just really gets to the heart of what we're doing and why we do all this. So I'm going to just shut up with this introduction and let's get started with today's conversation. Well, hey, folks, I want to welcome Steve Johnson and I want to thank Steve for joining us. Now, Steve operates the Uber Lyft driver's website and he has the Rideshare Rodeo podcast. And uh, Steve's also been involved with Para for quite a while, kind of way back from the beginning. And, and that's actually how Steve and I, I think, were first introduced to each other was the guys that uh, Para kind of connected us. And so uh, glad to have him on as a guest on uh, on the podcast here today. And Steve, kind of tell us a little bit more about, you know, maybe just uh, let us know a little bit about you're in the gig economy. You started out in Rideshare. Tell us a little bit how you got into that. And um, your role with Para, and uh, maybe kind of introduce yourself that way. Will do. Um, thanks for having me, Ron. Um, so yeah, so I got into rideshare in 2014 here in Denver. Uh, by the way, Ron and I actually live in the same city. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you if if you listen to my podcast or Ron's or whatever, and you did put it together, we both live in Denver. But so I got into it in 2014 with Lyft. Um, started doing it pretty heavily. I was making great money. Um, that's when it was still the percentage split. My original percentage split with Lyft was 90, 10, 90 to me, um, a year, about maybe 10 months, 12 months later, I signed up for Uber too, even though I was jamming with Lyft. Um, and I got an 85, 15 split again on that pl platform, killing it. So both platforms were just killing it for me. It could be a Tuesday night. I mean, no, no matter when you worked, you made a ton of money. They were still trying to populate drivers into this market, overpopulate, I should say. Sure. They were underpopulated and they were trying to overpopulate because as we all know, rideshare would fail immediately if the supply couldn't meet the demand. Right. Which I won't get into, but this is something that's going on right now, temporarily. But um and so you know I did rideshare. Uh I've done close to 30,000 rides between the two platforms. Um and in Four and a half years ago, so March of 2017, 17, 18, yeah, I think so. Yeah, it sounds um, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of 2017, uh, I feel like it's 2016, though. And it was our four-year anniversary this March. Maybe, what? regardless. Um, I started uberliftdrivers.com. And uh, we now have like 2,900 articles posted on there, both 
um, ag re-agitated ones and uh, um, ones that we've done ourselves. And uh, I started it because of everything that was going on with Travis, oddly. I didn't know where it would be going. I didn't really have a plan for it. But Travis was just causing more chaos than he had been even the, the whole year, that whole last year. You know, he was he was running around the world and we were hearing about him like he was Hugh Hefner, kind of. <laughs> You know, like this guy is just getting kicked out of countries and, you know, prostitutes and sushi bars and who knows. And so um, he was kind of just a trip to follow. So, you know, I kind of felt like this can't keep going on like this. It was getting real bad. And I remember it was, you know, in like February when I thought about it. And then in March, I did the first piece, which was the very first article posted is the video of him and the confrontation with the driver. Have you seen that before? Yeah. From back in the day yeah. where the driver tells him how he bought the car and how he now can't make the money and he's drunk and he's swearing at him and all that. So that was the first post. If you go back, you'll see it. Um, I've had to replace the video in that post, by the way, like seven times because they keep ripping it down on YouTube. No. <laughs> but after that, I wrote, you know, right. Like the next day was the Su the Susan Fowler incident. So right away, I did a piece on that. And I, I was just kind of doing news. And then when they when they actually kicked him out right after his mom died, I mean, everything was going crazy for this guy. And then they kicked him out and uh, um, Derek Kay came in and it just I just kept doing it because everything was so interesting. You know, Phantom was still going on. Uh, people were still using that Phantom problem, um, which you can find on our website if you want. If you're interested in it, I won't get into it, but you can go to uberliftdrivers.com, search Phantom. Um, and, uh, you'll see that pH, a, um, whatever phantom, but it's pH, uh, but you'll see what it was. It was a, a trick to evade police that they were using. Um, and some other stuff. So it just, it kept getting more and more interesting. And so anyway, I did that, I did that for a long time, kept driving. And when the pandemic hit, I had thought about, you know, doing a podcast, but then I did the podcast, uh, to help people who it, it started as I had had an idea to do it before the pandemic, but what it ended up being was it took the pandemic to start it. And I did this helping with PUA for about the first six, seven episodes. And oddly enough, I got contacted by a CBS news reporter, um, through a reporter I know at the Denver post. And she was doing a piece on what I was doing for free because I had done a lot of the States. So, and I kept diving into more about how gig workers are going to get this right as the care act passed. And when the article posted, it was me, it was two people quoted in it, me and David Pickerell. Okay. okay. So immediately I look at this other guy and he's, his quote was like stuff I had said to her too. And I'm like, wow, we're super aligned here. And so uh, I was like, I'm going to reach out to him. And I can't remember if it was him or me first. It might've actually even been him that like, right. As I was thinking, I'm going to reach out to him. Like the next day he contacted me through Twitter and because he got the handle from the article mm -hmm. and he contacted me and he's like we're both doing the same thing and i'm doing this thing with the technology air, air table and i said okay well then let's do it together and that was also the the forming of david and i which was april 2020 and that's when he was autonomy.jobs and we were starting to do we were together helping gig workers figure out how to navigate pua in the beginning when everybody needed it yeah, you know, we stopped when it became like maybe people were abusing it or whatnot. Obviously, mm -hmm. we just helped we helped jumpstart it because every you, you remember in the beginning, everybody was at home. We were all stuck at home. Yep, but they made it very hard to get the PUA and a lot of people really, really needed it. So it wasn't like we were trying to abuse the system. We were trying to just help the drivers. Yeah. And then we tried to help them with data through autonomy, getting their data like the UK gets. And uh, then every project since and we probably between David and I, we probably had 200 ideas that haven't happened yet. <laughs> so that's, like that's uh, me in a nutshell. I start throwing out ideas, say, Hey, yeah. you know, let's, what, what about if you did this or something like that? And they'll, they throw out stuff and it's just like, it, it's so easy to, to spend forever <laughs> just talking about. But I mean, the, I mean, like, you know, the one thing, I, the last thing I will say is that the podcast is like completely evolved since then. Like what I wanted it to be before I started it, how what I started it as and what it went through some morphing periods and different things and changes to what it is now. And I kind of feel like it's now it's like, and it's, it's in a pattern that I like. Yeah. I like the flow. Yeah. Yeah. I know there's been, there's kind of been a progression, I think in our, our last couple of episodes that makes you a really good guest on here. Because when I, 
you know, I took a few months off or something like that, started season two. And I started right away with uh, uh, David was actually a guest. David right. Pickerel, yeah. if you don't know who we're talking about, is the uh, CEO of Para. And Para has made a lot of news because of the way that they're able to, they were able to reveal the actual pay amount on DoorDash deliveries and things like that. And it'd be real easy to go down that rabbit hole. But, you know, David talked about some of the things that uh, you know, DoorDash had done and, and uh, trying to change their ability to help drivers out. And then the last episode mm-hmm. we got talking about the strike, the DoorDash strike uh, that a lot of drivers were doing. And, and a lot of that was, you know, it was fueled by anger over DoorDash hiding the tips uh, about DoorDash reducing pay. And I think there was even some anger over DoorDash changing the algorithm in a way that blocked Para from being able to help drivers out. There was a lot of anger about that out there. Mm-hmm. Still is. And it just seems to be getting worse. But, you know, the one thing that, so it was just kind of like there's there's all of this dissatisfaction with DoorDash, with gig, company, gig economy companies all around together. And then as you know, people were talking about going on strike. And the one problem with the strike is we're not employees. Exactly. But that kind of brings us into this week's topic and what I wanted to talk about, because you've had a lot of people on, you know, talking about this and, and this, it, it is this whole thing about, you know, should we be employees? Should we be, you know, independent contractors and then national legislation that is out there that's trying to force companies to, um, hire us as employees instead of independent contractors. And what does that all mean to us? And so wanted to talk about ProAct and you've had a number of people on about that. Mm -hmm. So kind of, um, you know, you've had quite a variety of guests and some different things like that. So maybe you can kind of take it from here and talk about some of the things that you have talked about both pro and con. Yeah. So, um, exactly right. You know, I've had, and oddly it's, I, I try and do this often, but it's it's really hard to find people on both sides of a of an issue that and you probably know this, Ron, very well. Like it's hard to have people on both sides of the issue on your podcast because sometimes how you feel, um, and I try and be very middle of the road, even if I lean one way or the other. Obviously, that's kind of my position to do that. But um, I also need other people to be respectful. And by that I mean like not get heated, not start like saying how it's bad about the other side instead, you know, like, like a debate, like, uh, you know, like a non-Trump debate, mm-hmm. <laughs> like uh, be respectful of the other person, you know, <laughs> I'm just saying that like, there are a lot of people I've wanted to have on, I get on a co- phone call with them. I'm like, there's no way I can have them on the podcast. Mm-hmm. So, but I have luckily with the pro act been able to find a couple people who in the, um, old school sense of independent contractors, uh, pre-app based on demand services, um, who have been just tragically destroyed by 85. And both of them have an understanding. One of them has a very good understanding. And Ron knows which one I'm talking about. That's Lisa Rothstein, who was on a podcast of ours that you can find. And then the other one is Gail Gordon. And they both just got destroyed. One of them is a freelancer in a bunch of different ways, six-figure earner. And uh, she has not been able to make a dime since AB5 in California. And she's a big proponent against no no AB5 um, and uh, no PRO Act. Gail Gordon had her opera house shut down. And it's a nonprofit opera house that has a very unique niche. Um, and for that reason alone, they're like, there isn't another one in the country that does what she does. And she's mm-hmm. out of business. She's been, she had been open for 25 years. She's done. She's closed. And she tried to stand up for the fight too. She didn't just shut the doors the first day and they lived down in LA County. So they, they, you know, her and her wife, I've talked to her or her and her husband have a, you know, have a good house and a, and a good living and probably enough that she could retire. She didn't want to though. Right. You know, she wanted to keep doing these, these plays or these operas. And so it was impossible. Um, I have had also Willie Solis on three times. And he's a controversial one for when I have him on because people who listen to the podcast regularly are like, why well, keep having Willie on? And I, Willie and I have a good uh, back and forth and a very good respect for each other. Even if like in one conversation, we don't agree on anything. We have a good, I mean, and that usually doesn't happen. It's actually usually really good conversations where both of us see a little bit of what the other's saying. Not, we never change our stance, but we kind of 
And we always talk about that even so that the, the audience hears it, that this is what needs to happen, not the shouting. Do you see how like yeah. we're talking and even though our, our views aren't changing, we're more accepting of the other side and try and be more empathetic to what they're going through, you know, or what, the, what they're feeling on this. Yeah. Because as, as hard as you feel on something, somebody else feels different about. It. So I've had the pleasure of having both sides. Um, me personally, I am apt. If I lived in California, I would be, I would be livid about AB five and its timing with the, um, with the pandemic and everything, and just uh, unreal, unreal right. how all that went down. And that, you know, the governor, Governor Newsom didn't. Re, like repeal it something he could have done maybe before all the people started calling for his removal you know i mean this is this was this the people who started the the removal of him act or the push is are the same people who you know were like get rid of this thing we're out of work yep, um, yep. so anyway you know i sit on the side of no ab5 and absolutely no pro act um i know a lot of the people in the non-app gig based at on demand uh world like those of us on all these gig platforms um, were under prop 22, but uh, you know, like the, the pro act uh, at least from, from the old school independent contractors outside of the app based uh, it, their big push is that the ABC test is taken out of the, of, of the pro act. And even I've even had it said to me from people who have a good understanding that as long as the ABC parts out, we don't even care if it goes through. Because that ABC part being removed allows the decision. And then I, I, the one question I did have for somebody is in the right to work states, though, does that allow them that? And yes, it would, because in those cases, it would allow the state to decide how it's worked. And like Ron, you and I have talked about, or, you know, just recently talked about was, um, you know, how like in those right to work states, what happens if you vote that you don't want a union? but 50.1% vote that they do. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about how, yes, you'll be forced into the union, but not only that, they actually share your information with these union members, your name, your address. I mean, now they can come to your home and it's just, I don't know. To me, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, you read the whole pro act and then there's like, like four line paragraph about the ABC test. And that's the most important part of it. Mm-hmm. To both ICs, both gig based and non gig based. Right. Just, you know, it's like keep the IR, IRS test, dump the ABC test. Yeah. And, you know, and probably one thing we should do before we go too much further into this, and, and it's this um, maybe defining what the PRO Act is um, for folks that maybe, maybe don't understand that or maybe haven't figured or heard much about the or paid attention to. Uh, AB5 in California, you know, you start off with, uh, and, and it, it comes back to this difference between employee and independent contractor, you know, that, you know, DoorDash, Grubhub, Uber Eats, Uber Lyft, you know, all these companies bring us on as independent contractors. And when we talked last week about the strike, um, you know, the problem is we're not employees and mm -hmm. we're contracted to be doing this work as businesses. And that makes it a little hard to do. The problem that some folks see with that is, okay, there's no guarantees. You know, when we're contractors, there's no minimum wage. You can't, yeah. you can't force DoorDash to say, okay, you're going to make this much money. You, you just can't do it. It's just, uh, and, and I think they can kind of, a lot of people feel exploited by that. And I, I think they do kind of, my feeling is, I, I do think that they do exploit that designation. But the response then is, um, it started in California, and actually ABC test has been around for a while. So they the created this, decision, okay, yeah. we're going to create a more rigid law around when you can use contractors, and they use this ABC test. And uh, it's a three-part test that determines whether or not, you know, if you meet any one of those three parts or something like that, then you can't. Let's see. Yeah. If you meet any one of those three parts of that test, you have to be hired as an employee. So tell us a little bit about what that is all about and how they determine that, you know? Right. So I'm actually looking for, so I can do, so I can provide it right. The ABC test here right now. Um, because I just, or just for, so I can read the three parts. Sure. Because it's the B prong that, that you can't pass. Yeah. The A and the C prong are passable. 
Um, and, and folks, remember that when we're talking about this portion too, um, like I said, IRS tests, not ABC. And Ron said, yeah, basically for, you know, forever, since there's been independent contractors and knowledge of them with the IRS, there has been an IRS test that absolutely works in established in determining whether you're an IC or not. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not one of those dated things or, you know, whatever that needs to be changed. It actually still applies. It still works. So here's the ABC test though. Um, so the it's, I'm going to tell you each of the three prongs, ABC. So, um, One, the individual is free from control and direction in connection with the performance of the service, both under his contract for the performance of service and in fact. That one's passable. Mm -hmm. Um, Two, the service is performed outside the usual course of business of the employer. And that's why... That is not passable. That's that's why... um, DoorDash will tell you that they are not a delivery company. Right. Because they're trying they're to pass called, that. Right. Because they're trying, they're trying to call themselves SAAS mm-hmm. software as a service. Yep. Um, so, right. So, and then three is the individual is uh, customarily engaged in an independently established trade occupation, profession, or business of the same nature as that involved in the service performed. Yeah. So not only are, is A and B is, is A and C passable, Oddly, C almost con- conflicts B, and it's like, what? By making C, how, why is B that, there? <laughs> C saying that you are doing a specific service, uh, profession, or business of the same nature as that involved in services performed. Okay, well, then there would be no way for anybody to pass B, people hiring or people looking for work. Yeah. And the thing is, is, yeah, like, you know, it's if you meet any one of those three, then the company cannot hire you as an independent contractor. They've got to hire us as employees. Correct. What happens if that happens? Well, we're forced to be employees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we have 85% of the drivers in this country don't want that. Right. So, I mean, first of all, you're going to only have the 15%. And how, and I mean, I got to say this, how many of those 15% are full-time? I'm just curious. Yeah. Uh, because oh if, they're, if, if many of them are just part-time, like, like so many on the platforms, mm-hmm. then there's going to be a huge issue with supply. There will be a big issue with cost to customer. You will lose mm-hmm. flexibility. Absolutely. And the P I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to be so point of fact, on, on a somewhat unknown, but people, I will tell you for certain, I've talked to a lot of people, I will tell you for certain that if you think at all that there's an employee model that has flex hours, you, you tell me one job in this world that allows that, you to work when you exactly. want. Exactly. Yeah, I think you're right. It doesn't exist. And, and that's just it. It is, and it really, it boils down to control. Whether or not you've got the freedom to operate as you see fit. And that's ultimately what the I, the, the existing IRS rules say. It, it really comes down to, there. It, it has to do with control and, and there are three tests that they've got and they're all different levels of control. There's behavioral control, there's financial control, and then there's the type of relationship. And all three things are about them controlling you. And, you know, if they're not, you know, if they're not controlling you, then, then you're not an employee. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> that's what this whole thing is really all about in the first place, I think, is, is control. It's about power. It's about control. It's about who gets to be in charge of stuff. A and, lot of the thing, too, I, I got to say is, I, you know, it always, it always baffles me, the people who just are on, like, these social media sites, like you've seen, Ron, too, where they're just bashing um, Uber for, for not living up to AB5. And yet these people work the platform. So you hate this company, but you want to be an employee for them. And when you get into that discussion <laughs> with them, no. I just got into a discussion with somebody here just in the last day that it was, you know, they were all about, well, we need to form a union. And it's like, you can't form a union. You're not employees. Well, right. yeah, but they're screwing us over. And it's like, well, then become an employee. Well, I don't want to be an employee. Folks, you can't have both. Right. <laughs> you know, if you want the freedom that goes with running a business, then run a business. And if you want the guarantees, then be an employee. 
And, but I think that's part of the question that's out there is whether or not these companies should be allowed to bring us on as an, as a contractor, as opposed to as an employee. There was a guy that I met that I can't remember which platform it was. It was kind of one of these intermediate platforms, you know, one of these little guys that was out there and he was actually an employee for them. So basically his job was to take, it, it was more like a product delivery type of thing, but his job was kind of to take those deliveries that they couldn't get anybody else to take. So they could control him. They could tell him where to go and things like that. So they had kind of a hybrid type of thing where most of their people were independent contractors, but then they had employees to kind of pick up the stuff in between. And maybe that's one way to maybe. do things, but to force it to be got, all to, or nothing. I don't yeah. know. And that's why people are saying remove if, if so, a lot of the people I've talked to you when I, when I, when I asked them what, you know, in the beginning, when I was asking, what do you mean IRS, not ABC? And they explained and showed me the difference way, way back when I was looking into this. Um, one of the things that they're just fine with is if there can be a way that everybody gets to decide, do you want to be in these unions, be yeah. at their mercy, be an employee, have to strike if you have to. Um, get a floor payment, which will also be your ceiling payment, by the way, folks, because they'll have to move to a franchise model or something of that nature. And at that time, you're going to you're going to have a boss. He's only going to hire a certain amount that meets his demand. Yeah, he's only going to put enough supply into the demand. So like almost like a, like Ron, you and I were talking about the um, service industry and bartending and stuff, almost like that, like you might have to like call in. Like when I was a bartender on certain nights, we had to call in and see if I was going to be needed. And a lot of times my boss, I'd, I'd be scheduled for eight. I'd call in at seven. He'd say, call back at nine. I don't know yet. Call back at nine. He'd be like, um, I don't think I'm going to need you tonight. So now my night night shot and I didn't even get to work. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you're going to, you're going to be seeing things like if you want to get minimum wage and health benefits, you're going to see things like this. Trust me. You're going to see, you're not going to be able to pick your hours. You're not even going to be able to pick where you work. They're going to, and you're going to, and by the way, you're, you're it, one nice thing for anybody that wants it though. I will say you're going to have a hundred percent acceptance, right? Yep. Cause you don't have, because the first time you miss one, you're fired. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, there's, I, I don't think a lot of people realize what they're asking for. If they want to be employees, uh, you got a delivery going to a bad part of town. Too bad. You got to take it. Mm-hmm. And um, they might not even provide you any information. Like at the end of the night, you might find out all your tips, whatever. You're not going to see money anymore. You're just going to see, go here, do this, do this. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a job, people. You're not going to be your boss. What about the people that say on the other side that there's no reason that an employer could not be flexible? There's not. There's absolutely not. They absolutely yeah. could. They could do both. They could do employees and flex, but I still put the gauntlet down. Show me that company. And if, right. I mean, like Ron was talking about there, there was one, but I'm just saying in the really big picture of the world, show me the company that allows that, that allows some people to have the employee status and others to have, they can, not only they can just, you know, be independent contractors, but now they can turn on and work whenever they want. Mm -hmm. Again, folks, if you're going to have in, in this scenario, if you're going to have the employees, the employee status and whether it's through Uber or Lyft or whether it's through a franchise, they're not going to allow independent contractors to because they're already going to have the employees modeled out for the region that they cover, how many they need, and they're going to schedule accordingly. They're not going to say, by the way, you other hundred people, you can just sign on. Yeah, because why are they going to then give a group of people the chance to turn down offers or cherry pick right. or and, anything like and, that? And remember this part too. Obviously, they're not because if the whole insurance thing starts to turn over on them. Mm -hmm. So now it's not how Uber and Lyft work with insurance. It's now going to be that they would have to, even if you're ICing, they would have to pay your insurance. Yeah. Or have you under their insurance. And now... And you're not an employee. Guess what, guys? Again, I hate to just be a realist, but that's not going to happen. Well, and I think here's the thing that I think about when when I hear those arguments that are things like, well, there's nothing that stops them from being flexible and and all of that. But it's like, OK, here's the one side where. You know, you're you're campaigning on how terrible these companies are, right? 
that they're, that they're exploiting you, that they're, you know, that they're scum. And I think there's plenty of reason to say any of them are scum, but you know, it's like all of a sudden, you know, that, that, that these gig companies, you bring out all the evilness of the gig companies, but then all of a sudden it, it's like, you're going to change, change the law and they're going to flip a switch. And now all of a sudden, are these guys going to become model citizens? They're going to give you all the hours you ever wanted, all the free time, the overtime that you ever wanted, if you wanted to do more than 40 hours, and they're going to give you all the flexibility you ever wanted. How is an evil giant going to all of a sudden become the best employer <laughs> ever just because you changed a law? No. And in fact, I would think that this evil giant will get much eviler. It's like you're poking him with a stick over and over till he has to like actually get his lazy butt up yeah. and go, okay, enough, you know, so I can guarantee, I, I just can guarantee. I mean, I really, I really feel like I can that no matter what the outcome of, of this would not be good. There may be a few handful of people that would like it, but I even think the system would be so disrupted that it would take a few, maybe a few years even for it to go through all these changes it'll go through on how it works and in the end, we'll be, it'll end up at a place way worse than what you guys are complaining or what anybody on that side is complaining about now. Yeah. Yeah. In I the think. end, I mean, it might begin as something decent, but I don't even think so. I think it would start off even bad, but I think it would evolve into a worse thing. Like, just like how rates have dropped, you know, but at least you can see the rates, know what you can make. And again, I can't stress it enough. I, all the people I know who have been doing this forever, all do it for the flexibility, obviously for the money. But it's not like this is the, you know, I don't mind the work the either, but it's not like this is the, you know, we're all fighting for this job. It's it's that this can work in any sit setting for you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I, I think that's the beauty of it because it's like, it is a, I call it a gateway drug in that it's, it's an opportunity to get into business for yourself without all of the things that you usually have to do to get into business. And so you get a chance to operate your own business. Uh, it's it's a taste of that freedom, but it is something that you could do it full time if you wanted to make it full time, or it could be the thing that you do during lunch hour or when you get home at the end of the day, because you just need to make some extra money to make ends meet or to pay the bills or save up for something. And there's that, you know, that freedom and the flexibility. And I think it was a lifesaver during the pandemic that people could just go out and make money and mm -hmm. not go through all the rigmarole that goes with employment. And right. you're going to take all of that away. And I mean, the bottom line is we, I mean, I don't, I don't, no matter where you live in the United States, it might not be as much as some cities, but right now I don't know anywhere in the United States that you can live and not walk out your door and go find a job today that it probably starts today. So if what you're looking for is minimum wage, maybe a little more than a minimum wage even, and uh, health benefits, I, I, I almost put the challenge to you. Go out for a day and look for a job, and I bet you have one by the end of the day. Yeah. So I why throw a grenade into what 85% what of us enjoy? No, I agree. You know, and here's the thing I think that I look at is that when you take seriously this idea that you're running a business, that's, that's the agreement that you signed. You said that you, you said, I agree that I'm an independent contractor. I agree that I'm contracting with you as a business and not as an employee. Well, when you're doing that, um, that makes DoorDash or Uber or Instacart or any of those companies that actually makes them your customer. And, and here's the reality is when you're running any kind of business is your customer is going to try and screw you, you know, <laughs> they are going to take advantage of you. And, and I think DoorDash is the epitome of that type of customer. DoorDash is probably <laughs> the customer that would shoplift from your store, you know? <laughs> he's, he's the one coming in the restaurant to put a finger in the hamburger. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, is when you're running a business and that's the reality that you're going to have customers that are going to try and get away with crap. Mm -hmm. But you work around that and you still make your business profitable and and you deal with that right. but do you want to turn that worst customer into your boss <laughs> well put <laughs> i don't yeah so. exactly it's like okay i can i can deal with doordash as my customer no matter how crappy they get 
And if at some point it gets to be too bad, then it's like, okay, I'm done with DoorDash for a while. I did that with Uber Eats for the longest time because I didn't know where they were, where it was going, anything like that. And it's like, okay, I'm done with you guys for a while until you make it better. They made it better. And now I think I do more Uber Eats than anybody else, but that's the freedom that we've got with that. But it's like, if I don't trust them as a customer, I certainly don't trust them to be my employer or my boss. Yeah. I also, you know, I'd say that, look at this too. I've been doing ride share long enough where I know, you know, if you go back even three years, if you go back to when I started in 2014, for sure. But if you go even back three, four years, um, there wasn't one person complaining about, we need to be employees because we were making a lot more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that kind of, you know, in 2014, it was amazing. Like you didn't even care where the money was coming from. You just go work for a while and get a ton of money. And then by 2017, you know, it had gone down a bit and the ways were changing, but there was the surge coming on and it was the multiplier in the beginning. Then it went to flat and surge and all these changes. So they're ever evolving the platform and I'm not defending Uber here no, at all, at all, no. or left with the algorithms they use and some of the things that Ron and I probably don't want to even get sidetracked here on are disgusting and wrong. However, they do tell you what you will earn per mile. They do tell you what you will earn per minute. So that's up to you because it really then has to become a balance of, yeah, I know this. You don't need to fill my head with a bunch of stuff about it. And I, I, I'll work it and make it work for me because I need flex to be able to do this. And if you can't make it work, then you don't work that platform anymore. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's that's the big thing right there. It's like if you own a restaurant and somebody walks in and offers you two bucks for the prime rib. Right. <laughs> you're going to say no. <laughs> you know? Right. right. Unless you're like really desperate. And if you're that desperate, you're going to go out of business. But, you know, but the only time that we really started hearing all this voice about, you know, we need AB five and forget these companies was really just when the rates went down that, that very, like there was just one too many times. And when I remember it just went down one more time. And as soon as it did, it's, I think it's even gone down a time since, but as soon as it did, it, it was getting pretty ridiculous and it needs to be looked at now that it, we're post pandemic for sure by these companies. But I remember that's when people started being like, this is crap. And, and all new drivers were getting on social media and seeing it and going, I'm thinking the same thing. First of all, if you've only been driving under six months or a year, shouldn't have an opinion because all jobs take a while to really understand, mm -hmm. you know, or all gigs or whatever, you know, but again, it's, are you making it work? Can you give up things in your life to be able to work the hours you need to, to make the money you're trying to make? But then again, it's your flexible time. You get to pick when it is. Any change to this, and I can, people can say what they want, guys. Again, I'm going to say it. Flex is gone under an employee model. It's gone. Yeah, it is. So you talked about how, you know, prices were going down and everything like that. And I know your experience has been on the rideshare side of things. And it seems like this race to zero. And it seems like it's going that way with delivery too, that, that everybody's kind of following suit. It was paying really good for a while and it just kind of slowly goes down and down and down. Do you see, let me know your thoughts. Cause I, I, I'm going somewhere with this, but let me know your thoughts on, on where Uber and Lyft are right now with their struggles trying to get drivers right now. Do you see that as part of kind of a natural result of what they've been doing or is it strictly pandemic related? I think that it's, well, I think it's both. And I think that it's pandemic related, even in two ways. It's pandemic related that people got very feared off by it. Um, it gave them time to evaluate. I do think that there is way, way, way more people on PUA than people realize mm -hmm. um, still. And I think that when that ends September 6th, I think we're going to see a huge influx back to the app-based gigs because schools will be starting, college football will be rolling out. Um, it's kind of like that, you know, new, new year feeling almost, yeah. and it's going to be like, and we're, and a lot of people are feeling very safe to go do things these days. So I think that you're going to see people just waiting out because you can't get the PUA and work. Right. You know, if you start saying that you're working, they, well, I mean, you can, but they'll start taking it out against part of it, you know, whatever the formula is. And then if you do it too many weeks, they would call you an employee or that you're working and you need to get back to it. Um, so nonetheless, you can't be doing both. You know, so people, I, I think that, you know, I've talked to a few people who are just like, yeah, I'm sure it'll make a difference, but not that many people are left. And I'm like, I, okay, I, I think you're wrong. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that once that money stops flowing into them, obviously reality sets in. How do you pay for stuff? Yeah, that's true. I kind of wondered how much, you know, just, you know, that the, the Uber and Lyft has just been begging for drivers. And I wonder how much of that is just that they've kind of created this relationship or they've done with the relationship, what they have to a point where they've burned so many bridges that they can't get enough drivers to come back now. So my take on this is, is maybe a little bit different than most. So okay. you know how they did that? What was it? The $250 million campaign to bring drivers back. Right. And the way they spent that to me was like, it's like everything with Uber. And I mean, I, I'm not, I don't have a 60 person think tank team to go through this with and they do. So I'm always surprised when I'm like, that seems dumb. But I feel like the way that they rolled that out was really dumb. I do. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like that there was a lot better use of that money than just like increasing, you know, like, like people's like uh, referral rates and stuff and having some crazy number on it still when they're even when they were really doing it, rideshare, like we're now rideshare passengers are back in full drivers are not. But this was at a point when even the rideshare passengers weren't back fully. And they were doing this referral system. So if you referred somebody, they were really making it a, a, you know, they were saying 140 rides in a month. That would take like 80 hours a week, not normally, not pre-pandemic. But at that time when they were doing it, it was it wasn't like there was rides everywhere. Right. At that time, there wasn't riders or drivers too many. So I mean, it just you weren't going to be able to hit that number most of the time. Um, I do know we talked about uh, when you were on the podcast and we had uh, Jason from Idaho, Jason from Michigan and David and all of us, um, the one I call the Ocean's Eleven episode. <laughs> um, you know, I, I do know that uh, they were also, if you remember, Jason uh, Peason from uh, Drive to Win 13 in Idaho was telling us uh, that they were re-onboarding drivers who hadn't been kicked off the platform, but hadn't worked for even like a year or two or three years prior to the pandemic. They were now offering them the incentive of uh, do 140 rides, get $1,800 to come back. Yeah. Just crazy. So you were getting like, even a, like you were getting these big things that you're not supposed to get except for one time. Right. So they were even like hitting up drivers that hadn't drove in three years and saying, Hey, cause nobody really, nobody closes their Uber accounts. So like, let's right. say you do it for two years and you take a full-time position, 60 hours a week as a salary position. And it, that you know, account is still just, yeah, I mean, it's happen. most likely you're not going to call them and say, I want to close it. I mean, if you're sure and stuff, sure. But you want to think about it because if you close it, it might be very hard to reopen. I don't right. know, but um, you're better off just kind of leaving it. They already have your data. So it's not like they're stealing more data from you. They've already stolen it. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> they've already got that in the pocket, you know, but there's no reason to really discontinue because you don't know what's coming up down the road ahead. You yeah. might need some extra scratch or you might get canned. Who knows? Yeah, no, I get that. I, you know, and kind of the reason that I wondered about that or was where I was going with that is there's a piece where you wonder how much does the market actually start to police some of the actions of these companies that it's like, once you go too far with how you treat your contractors, now all of a sudden you can't get enough contractors. And, and I wonder when the time will come when, you know, DoorDash and Grubhub come to mind the most, you know, it's just kind of like deactivating people at the drop of a hat or, you know, the stuff that uh, DoorDash pulls with hiding the tips um, with, with some of the crap that they've been pulling with para and just different things like that, that eventually does that thing come back to bite them in the butt where all of a sudden now they've moved on to more drivers, but all of a sudden you get to a point where there's not enough new drivers to bring on to match with all the bridges that they've burned and do they, you know, does, does the market take care of itself on a lot of these things more than trying to force changes through legislation? Right. I don't, you know, I don't know. That's rough, rough, rough question because I mean, like what do we have 1.6 million dashers in this country? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's to me. And again, I, you know, I'm not really breaking it down to the state and all the cities and taking in the, the size of every city and every state right now, but it just seems like too many. I don't know why it just does. And I'm, and that's been the model of these companies. So I'm sure it is, is to have way too many people working it. I was thinking, so I think there I needs remember. to be some way to like, not necessarily limit, but it may be at least like cap bringing people, uh, onboarding people at certain times when a market hits a certain level and is maintaining it, even if it's different mm -hmm. drivers, 
if they're like, you know, let's say that like on Tuesday night, you need a par of a hundred drivers on and that par of on Tuesday night, every week is a hundred people. And on all your other nights, it's pretty close to meeting the par of need. They shouldn't be onboarding too many more. Yes. Some people will quit and whatnot, but as soon as they do, you start onboarding again. And then within days you're, you're, you've got thousands more. Yeah. Cause especially cause it, now people would be waiting to be onboarded. So mm-hmm. you'd actually have a waiting list of people who you could, you know, say, okay, four people quit, let's onboard 10. Right. Right. Yeah. I don't know. You know, and can I think to, on, that- to onboard everybody is just rude and taking advantage of the situation in my mind. Oh, I believe I, I agree completely, you know, and I think that's part of what makes this a little bit of a complicated topic because there's the side that is just like, okay, we absolutely do not want to be employees. At least I know you and I don't No, And, no. and I, you know, like I said, you know, 85% of people don't, um, I think out of those 85%, you know, half of them still think that they are, but <laughs> that's a whole well, and they, and, and, they, and, and also the, you know, there's, there's a few stats out there that range from 88% to 91% that um, are part-time drivers. Yeah. So let's yeah. say 91, if 91% are part-time, they, I'm guessing that they absolutely need the flex because my guess is they have another job. I think I, or I other gigs listening. or whatever, you know, independent contractor stuff or whatever. Right. Like I was me. listening to the um, interview on another podcast with the, um, was it the president of operations or something from DoorDash? And I think he was saying on that, that it was 90%. And, you know, he mentioned, I think at the time, about 2 million drivers and like 90% of them were eight hours or less a week. Right. <laughs> and yeah, that, that tells you, but you know, right one there. thing too, I really, really don't, when I'm talking about getting stats, and maybe I do it wrong, but I try and get it from like sources and people that I email with who are reporters and might know outside of just posting and social and whatnot. But I try and stay away from what these CEOs say. Sure. No, I mean, I, I dude, they could be cooking these book numbers they read so bad. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, he can come out and say anything. He can come out and say 2%. That's true. You don't get access to DoorDash's books. You won't be able to fact check it. Yeah. But I think, you know, and there's definitely a trust issue when it comes to DoorDash. Oh yeah. Um, all of them. Let's be honest. I think that's, all of them. that's part of the problem is that there is, there's so much bad behavior on the part of the gig companies that people are trying to figure out how do you police that? You know, um, let me ask this question. Do you think that, Uber and DoorDash and all these other companies are exploiting the independent contractor model in any way. Um, Yeah, I do. And I think that, however, again, I'm going to go back to what you just said, that you and I and 85% of the other, of the people doing this want to stay independent contractors. And that I do, that's my first and foremost must happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So before I say this, but yes, I do. I think that Especially, I think there's some severe ethical problems for sure on the part of AB5 was incorrect, which turned into AB2257. They're one and the same, but it was so sloppy written and whatnot. But it was not right. And it hurt a ton of people. They developed Prop 22 not to save a lot of the people who also needed it, but just to save the app based community, um, gig workers. And People had to vote for Prop 22, who probably would have, based on the companies behind it, Uber, Lyft, Instacart, and DoorDash, who put in $200 million to push Prop 22, it was necessary for those 85% who want to stay to vote yes on it, regardless of how you felt. But it's weird to look at that proposition and see those four you know, huge corporations that have treated people so poorly are the ones backing the initiative you have to vote for to override a law that was incorrect. Yeah. So I do. Here's the problem though. Now I think that now that it happened and it passed, I think that they're kind of starting to step outside of the margins of prop 22, which, Mm -hmm. you know, we, everybody had to vote for, for prop 22 in California who wants to be IC and they did. 
but and then there was there's this whole prop 22 written out of what it is and i honestly i find a lot of errors in it like i think that there's a lot of stuff that you could you could argue they're not doing oh absolutely i agree here's you know? here's the irony in prop 22 prop 22 by definition actually puts them in violation of the irs test because of the hourly pay that's the financial control and you got that hourly minimum that actually provides financial control. It gives them a little more control because they you, they can control whether or not you multi app things mm -hmm. like that. So I, that's that's the part that I find fascinating. Nobody's touched on that yet, but someday well, that may come up. I don't know. You know, here's how I, here's how I see that because I've heard the multi apping thing a bunch, and I actually see it like this. Um, I don't think there maybe there's been some incidents, but I don't think they're really cracking down on it. But they've got it in the language, again, how you and I were talking about how when newbies come on, they see the acceptance rate. People acceptance rate doesn't matter anymore in right. California. And the model that they're moving around the country to fight the PRO Act and to fight Massachusetts right now, mm -hmm. legislation, is it doesn't matter. You can, I mean, and many of you dashers out there, I'm sure will know that, you know, you have two to 5% acceptance rates. <laughs> I've seen you guys post them, so I know it's true. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, they don't matter there. I think that Ron and I were talking and we both kind of think that they're more like put there for the newbies to kind of scare them almost for a while until sure. they get the hang of things. Yep. And I, that's part of their MO really. It, yeah. I, I see it in the behavior of these companies that it really is about, they can't legally control you, but they control a lot of drivers through fear. And, right. um, and I think that's what the whole deactivation thing is about. It's about, you know, it's kind of like deactivate that just one, enough people to scare the rest of the drivers into submission. Well, and also, what I guess what I was, the other thing I was trying to get at with that was that, yes, maybe they've deactivated a few. And I don't even know that. I've seen a few people say it and whatnot. I'm not, I don't know about it. But um, nonetheless, I think that it's a nice tool for them to have in their pocket. Who knows that if things get more sloppy and messy, they might start using it. Mm -hmm. I mean... They're not exactly the greatest wizards of technology people, but like these, these, the app based companies still might be working on things to find ways to find out if you are multi apping. Sure. You know, right now, I'll just tell you, they don't have that ability. Right. You'd have to almost catch yourself. You'd have yeah, to have one app on and you'd have to be driving the wrong way and accept an order that yeah. was some other, you know, I mean, something dumb. You'd have to do something dumb that would flag you. Yeah. Now here in California, they, or I'm sorry, here in Colorado, they can't prevent you from multi-apping. Um, and in California, they can't, as far as if you're, you know, you, you do one platform as soon as you're done, then you turn the others on and they can't prevent that. The only thing that they can prevent is like picking up deliveries for Uber and DoorDash at the same time. But even then, how do they know, unless you're dumb enough to take a delivery from DoorDash that goes way North and at the same time as you take one from Uber Eats, it's going way south. Right. That that kind of becomes a little more obvious then. Right. But um, and maybe some people who get really good at it actually know. Well, this one's I'm only going a half mile out of my way, and then I only have to go three quarters of a mile to drop my first one off. Then I can take the second, and that wouldn't be enough to flag it. And maybe some people have learned little tricks like that. I don't know. Yeah. But nonetheless, like that is the way. Probably in my mind that they would catch you is. Right. The other, the second platform where you accept one saying, where's this guy going? Yep. I think there's a reality out there that ultimately, if people really understood what it was being an independent contractor, and if, if the relationship really were a business to business relationship, you know, across the board, DoorDash and Uber and Uber Eats and Grubhub and any of these companies wouldn't have enough contractors to complete the deliveries because if, if they were making sure that people really understood what they were getting into, um, they wouldn't have enough people. And I think right. that's the area where I feel like there's some, and maybe you would even call it misclassification, but I think that that's an area where there's a problem with the independent contractor model because the problem is that these companies want, they want you to be an employee, but they want to pay you as an independent contractor. Right. And I think there's a problem. And I think that's why we're, I, I think that has a lot to do with why 
we're in this situation now with ProAct because then you get people fed up and what they want to do is they want to go to the opposite extreme and just force them to hire employees. And I'm not sure that's the best idea. We'll get to that in a second. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, 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 I honestly am still sh- kind of sticker shocked by how many people I start talking about um, ProAct with and they're like, what is that? Yeah. And they're like full-time gig employees on like six platforms. I'm like, what are you talking? How do you not know? You don't need to know what Ron and I know, but how do you not not know about this? Yeah. This is your future ending. (laughs) It is. And and there, there is something I I think very real about that. Um, Most likely it's not going to go through. We just saw the infrastructure bill go through. Right. On what was it? Tuesday. Um. Yes. Yes. Okay. So on Tuesday it went through and then Tuesday night, they pushed the 3.2 trillion package. And from what Ron and I could find, it was just really the only parts of things to do with project were regarding rails because it had something about Amtrak in there, but it really didn't address the ABC test or any kind of change of that nature that we found anyway. Right. Yeah. Because ProAct as a bill by itself is stuck right now. It's, it's essentially, they're going to need to get, as things stand right now, 60 votes to be able to push that thing through. Um, there are, but, you, but you know, look at, they shoved it in, or they were trying to shove it exactly worded as it was into infrastructure. Yeah. Which yeah. was just incorrect. Yeah. And that's, you know, and that's maybe one of the things. So, you know, right now, as far as that act by itself is not likely to happen, mm-hmm. but just like what you said, the uh, infrastructure thing. Um, the government has a way of trying to hide these things in something. If it's not going to pass by itself, we're going to try and hide. Um, we're going to try and hide it in in, in some other bill. And uh, you know, when they passed the stimulus bill at the end of December of last year, they snuck in a little piece that changed the 1099k ruling which for Uber, Uber Eats, Lyft drivers, um, that changes when you have to uh, report your taxes from $20,000 to $600. And so if you've been delivering for them and you're used to uh, not having to uh, report your taxes because you're not getting a 1099, get ready for a change this year. And that's not a small number of the drivers. What was the other one that you talking about that they pushed through as part of the infrastructure? The um, the uh, gas. Okay. Where right, they get... I'm not sure where it is and I'm not even, you know, again, it's not like it's an easy read guys. And right now they tried to shove so much stuff in infrastructure that didn't belong that has been weeded through. So it's kind of waiting. We're kind of waiting on a final draft that we can really read. There's a lot of stuff yeah. out there you can read and try and get ideas from where it was to where it is. But, you know, we're never a hundred percent sure of what's going on over there because they're also trying to kick it through reconciliation. Um, yeah. But I mean, so they're just trying a lot of maneuvers and hopefully, you know, we'll get that shut down. Um, we have three standouts, Democrats in the Senate. Um, I just want to mention them while I'm thinking of it. Uh, the Democrat from Arizona, uh, actually two from Arizona and one from Virginia, uh, Kristen uh, Cinema, uh, Mark Kelly and Mark Warner from Virginia. And Mark, Mark Warner is kind of a key to this. If he stays firm on this, I honestly think we won't see the pro act go through at all. No, I don't think they will, you know, and, and for, for I don't think we will anyway, but as long as he stands strong, I think it's like solidified. Right. Kind of just to explain to anybody that didn't quite understand how this works with getting the votes through pro act has passed the house of representatives, but it has not passed in the Senate in the Senate. They have to get 50 votes. The Democrats are the one pushing it through. Right now, they've only got 47 votes. Um, to pass a, to pass something, you have to get 50 votes. But if there's enough opposition from the other side where they're going to do what's called a filibuster, then they have to get 60 votes. And so those are two different things. And we could spend a lot of time talking about how all that works. Right. But there's two different things there You know that basically say it is probably not going to pass as it is. So um, the, the PRO Act has passed the House for three years in a row. It passed in 2019, last year, 2020, and mm-hmm. this year, 2021. And as the PRO Act, now, before it went to the Senate this week, they tried, you know, they were trying all these things to shove it into infrastructure. 
And it, right. luckily it ended up that they didn't shove that portion in. Right. The ABC test and any of that. So that kind of, it still leaves it at bay how it's being handled and it could be extra dirty and deceiving how it's being done. I don't know, but at least it won't be shoved through in the infrastructure bill at this point. Exactly. Yeah. And I think those are the two things that we probably have to keep an eye on is that there's really two ways that it could pass. Um, one is that you can change the rules, which basically mean you don't have to have the 60 votes but then they still have to get those three senators to go on board, you know, right. so, but they can, they can change the rules. Um, when we talk about reconciliation. That was actually like a rule change that happened a few years ago that allowed budget bills to go through with only 50 votes. The other thing is they can hide it. Like we were talking about, they were going to try and hide it in the infrastructure that got blocked. They could hide it in something else. So there's always that possibility that it can still get pushed through. It doesn't look like it's going to pass, but that's a high priority for a lot of people that they want to get this thing pushed through. It is. Um, and even I, you know, we, we sit in a weird position because even Joe Biden ran to be able saying he was going to help push this through. Yet last year we saw the government make so many contracts with Uber and Lyft. You know, so I mean, like, how is he straddling that horse? I mean, you can't say you're going to, do everything for the the people who want to be employees, but you're working with the company as it stands right now. Yeah, yeah. Because that's an that's that's not even kind of that's an endorsement. Right. No, I I get that. Um, kind of one last thing I want to touch on because you know it it at least right now doesn't look like it will go through. Uh, you don't want to rest too easy. Um, and, and I think with the senators that you just mentioned, if, if you're in a state with those senators man, get a touch with them and say, Hey, stay the course, stay the course. Don't, don't go changing your mind now or something like that. You know, that I e think email it, them, email them, anything. You can find the emails on the government site. So is there a better way to do things? It, we, Cause we know there, there's a problem here. There's, there's a problem with the misbehavior by the gig companies, mm -hmm. but if, forcing them to hire employees isn't the way to go. Is there a better way to take care of this? Is there a better way to take, you know, do something about the way that these companies are acting? Do you think? Uh, you know, I mean, we can watch how the worker class plays out in London and Europe. Okay. Um, you know, cause the Supreme court ruling that, you know, here in America, we have, you know, when you're talking about in this form, we have independent contractors and employees. Those are the two things. And there's Supreme no way court, between. Right. And the Supreme court over, over across the pond ruled finally that, cause, and they, their arguments have been going on a little longer than ours too. So oddly you can kind of watch them as a little bit in front of us mm -hmm. in return, in regards to how they're treating the gig economy. They got on it a little bit quicker than the U S so sure. they're a little bit ahead. So it's kind of nice to watch how it plays out because they just finished making their worker class status. And so what is got that worker class status? Gig workers, app-based on-demand gig workers for the platforms that we've been talking about today over there. They've got other ones like Deliveroo and um, the one that uh, you were talking about, Just Eat or whatever. Oh, yeah, the guys. That yeah, all those. Them. I mean, like there's a lot of other things too, but they have Uber and stuff. They don't have Lyft, but they've got their own versions of all these and right. if you're if you're working those platforms, you are now in the worker class, which is not fully employee, but it has some protections that independent contractor doesn't have. Is that right? Right. It, okay. And you are guaranteed an hourly minimum wage. Mm -hmm. So I mean, like you're guaranteed to make X amount if you stay on for the hour. Like so, if you only make, I don't, you know, I'm just going to use arbitrary numbers. If if it's twenty dollars or fifteen dollars that they're guaranteeing, you'll make you only make nine you're going to still get 15. Yeah. So it's a, a weird system. And I, I don't know that it'll, I, I think it'll be, I don't think in London, it, they don't, they're not really able to challenge if they can, but I, I mean, try and challenge a Supreme court ruling over there. It doesn't happen. You don't overturn it. So this is now fact. I think that now it's watching it evolve. How will it change? Yeah. Cause you had a guy on your podcast that was from over there at one time, didn't you? Yeah. More at a few times. Yeah. Okay. Okay. He's, he's my ears on the ground. He's a, he's a blogger over there. Um, it's driver app London. Um, he's a good guy. And, uh, he write he kind of writes about some stuff going on, um, okay. on, from the street, from the driver perspective. 
and he's got a, lo a lot of London people who comment. So, you know, I had reached out to him and we kind of had a conversation a bunch of times before I had him on, but yeah, he, he's shed light on it a few times. I think it's up our episode 51 of rideshare rodeo is, is the one where he fully breaks down uh, the worker class right after it got done. Yeah. So um, guys head over to the rideshare rodeo podcast and give that one a listen because I think that's, that's at least something, if you're thinking about, is there, is there an in-between, maybe that is an option. The only other thing I can think of is, is there, you know, why, why isn't there any kind of effort out there to police the control over steps that are taking place out there? It's kind of like, if you can't control the independent contractor, I don't think that means that you have to force us to be employees. Can you still police those oversteps and things like that? You know, it's really weird that everything would go away for all the headaches and lawsuits that Lyft and Uber and all these companies spend every day. They're wasting so much money, not just on having attorneys on retainer, but active attorneys fighting cases all over the world. And right here in the U.S., if they literally just went to a split, 80-20, 75-25, everything, every headache would go away immediately for them. And then they could adjust their, their, their pricing model to reflect, we need to make our nut uh, based on the 25%. Mm -hmm. And then therefore, us drivers know, hey, they're going to make us as much money as they can. We don't need to see surge in all this anymore. We would just know, we know we're going to make as much as we can because they're going to, they need to make their money and it's only 25%. Yeah. And that, that becomes, I think, even more of a true contractor model because exactly what you're getting now is based on what they're getting. And, and, and it's really almost like a direct payment from the customer then. And it actually goes back to the initial campaign of Uber, be a driving partner. That way, like, I don't have to like look at rides and go, ah, I don't want that one. Or, uh, I, I'll just take everything you send me because I know you're working your butt off to make as much money on every ride as you can. Because if you're taking 25%, you got to make, they got to make sure they're making their numbers, which will change the rates, which have been needing to change. They don't need to be 200% like they are now, but they need to come up. Here's an interesting thing. You mentioned that be a driving partner. And this is just a little tidbit that maybe isn't related at all, but I was talking with somebody from, Uber or about Uber Eats, about um, kind of like an advertising relationship, something like that. One of the things that they told me was that the content on my website, if I'm doing that, I can't mention Uber as a partner. They don't even want to <laughs> use the word partner anymore. No, they've completely, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, I've actually seen it in the website on a couple spots. And I almost think with the way I know these companies, I always thought, you know, there's no way they miss stuff, but they actually do. I think they've removed a couple things, but right. they really have tried to unbrand the partner thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and to the point that if, you, if you're doing a kind of like this advertising affiliate relationship with them, they won't even, you know, they won't do that partnership if you're calling them. If, or they won't do the partnership with you as a publisher if you're calling the relationship of drivers with them a partnership. Right. Well, I mean, it, and it's changed a few times. I remember that for years when they, when they were first getting away from the partnership, it was their big thing was earn on your time. When it changed from be an Uber partner, mm -hmm. it changed to earn on your time. And I think it's changed again now, but I mean, like for years it was yeah. earn on your time. Yeah. And I think that was their way of unbranding they get it, themselves so. into though, is that, 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 that lack of consistency exactly. that it's like, Ultimately, we don't matter. And <laughs> they're my customer, so I don't care. <laughs> right. I mean, I don't exactly. take that personally, but it is an attitude that ultimately that I think that's part of what's getting them in trouble. And so one thing I think for sure is they need to look at, you know, their pricing model right now. You know, they were, you know, before the pandemic and when they were in a race to the bottom, never would Uber go one penny above a lift price. You know what I mean? Or whenever possible, obviously in real time, it's hard to do that, but I mean, they would try to always stay right there. And it was a race to the bottom a little bit who can undercut as far as what, and then now we're seeing 200, 250% rates that passengers are paying. That's the first time they've ever done that. So they didn't even do like 
like it should have been they just the shot. initial move up. They just said pandemic, boom. And it's and I feel like part of that so that they can lower it back down, but not get it back to where it was. Right. And because if you do 250 percent to people that are let's say that like you fl- fly out uh, twice a month to a city and you know that an Uber ride is forty dollars to your house. If right now it's a hundred and you're like, what the heck? And they roll it back to 60. You'll be like, sweet. But yeah. really, it's not. They just raised it 20 bucks on you. Yeah, exactly. I, that's uh, that's the thing where I heard that Trump used to do as far part of, part of his uh, negotiations was, you know, he would ask for something so outrageous that people would get, you know, just all up in arms. So then he'd come back with something else and it's like, okay, that's better. And what he's done is he's actually gotten away with more than what he was asking for to begin with. And it sounds like mm-hmm. kind of what, what Uber's doing. Um, are, are drivers on the rideshare side because, because the rates are getting so outrageous out there, are drivers getting that money at all? So <clears throat> it's, odd, it's odd you say that. All the people I talk to, um, no. What, it, what I've heard from people is um, you might make more per hour because you have never ending rides which is something we stopped seeing even way before the pandemic. Right. You know, you often were sitting idle. And if you're not, if the wheels aren't moving, you're not making money. So, I mean, a lot of times you were sitting idle those days, I think right now, anyway, in almost every market are gone. If you turn on, you will have rides the whole day. So therefore you're probably making more per hour, but you're also spending more on gas, but you're, you're not getting more for the right. Road, I mean, really and, right. You're not being paid in relationship. More. However, I just had like a really intense email written to me by a New Jersey driver who listened to the podcast uh, this week where I was talking about that and said, she actually sent me all her stats. And I'm looking at having her on the podcast because she's like, I don't know that I agree with that. I actually am making more money. Oh, that's interesting. And she sent me a bunch of like, actually, it was crazy. She's sending me like all these full breakdowns of her numbers. It was a really well articulated email. It was about three pages. So I'm, I contacted her. So would you want to come on the podcast? Because I'd like to talk about this. That is interesting. I, you know, and the reason I wondered that a little bit was I can remember a snowstorm one time and I looked up and I was just like, I wonder what's going on with Uber Eats right now or something. And I pulled them up and they were doing like $20 delivery fees. And right. I was like, oh dude, I should be out there delivering right now. And I pull up the app. There was no extra, there was no surge. There was nothing extra. They were not paying any extra, but they're charging the customer a whole lot more money. And what that actually ends up doing is I think, you know, what I think it was probably doing was probably costing drivers money because what happens is that the customer, Oh, they see that $20 fee and they just figure, okay, the driver must be making a lot more money for doing that. And so I don't need to do a tip on top of it. (laughs) So the driver still gets the same money and they get less in tips. And exactly. So, and also when you mentioned, what I I'm, I'm guessing anyway, when you mention a snow day, we see snow here on the front range sometimes here and there, but when Ron's talking, what I think Ron's talking about with snow day is really dangerous roads, extreme. Right. A lot of people who have snow, wherever you live, it, you might not see what he's talking about. Like these are the days that it is truly dangerous to be out there. Yeah, exactly. That type of a day. And so, and you know, again, it, it's kind of like, it's that inconsistency and, 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 that's all the stuff I guess we're trying to solve today is it's like, okay, they don't treat us like independent contractors all the time, but we don't want to be employees and there's got to be a way in between. And one of these days we'll get that, we'll get that problem solved. <laughs> yeah. I mean, bottom line people is really think through, do you, why do you, I guess I would do a pro cons list of why you want to be an employee of this company. I think you might be very sticker shocked on that one too, to see, wow, my cons list is really long. <laughs> yeah. If you're honest with yourself. And, yeah. If you're being very honest and you're sitting alone and you're just doing this, you might find like, okay, I'm going to do this to prove him wrong. You might find that your pro list is only one or two things. And that when, if you're really being honest and adding in, I'll lose my flex. I will be an employee. I'll have to work when they say I'll have to take every ride. I, I will be paid a floor payment. And that will also be my ceiling payment. Yep. Um, just ev- everything. If you're really being honest and you put this down, it's not going to look as good on paper. Yeah. Yeah. And then you wonder at what point does the tips go away? Right. Well, because, I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, why, why wouldn't they take it off? Because these companies, if, if they have to pay you as an employee, 
they'll just kind of be like, well, if they want to tip you, they'll do it cash because we want to make it look like they don't have to spend any more than this. Exactly. What And that's what happened in California with Prop 22 when uh, especially Grubhub was the worst one at this, that all of a sudden now they have to pay this minimum amount and they quit suggesting a tip based on a percentage. A lot of times it was either like one, two or three dollars, fifty dollar order, and they're suggesting a dollar for the tip or they're not suggesting anything for the tip. And they even put a note in there that says basically the point where the driver's making enough now because of this program that you don't need to tip. And, and the whole reason for that was Grubhub put on a surcharge to cover their extra cost, and but they didn't want the total amount to look like customers have to pay more. So essentially what they did was they took it away from the drivers. And mm-hmm. that's the part that I think you want to be really careful about if you get yourself, if you push them into an employee model, that's the thing you got to be careful about is they're going to pull that kind of crap. Right. So... Steve, thank you so much for all of your time here. I have kept you on probably longer than I think you planned on being on here. <laughs> and I appreciate that. And I did that to you yesterday when we got together. For no, no, I, we did it to each other. Yeah, Ron and I hadn't ever met in person. And we actually we were able to go out and have a coffee yesterday. And I think both of us were thinking an hour, but it, it just turned into an organic conversation that we shut really down good. the bar. <laughs> yeah, t- yeah, we shut down the coffee we shut bar. Down the coffee house. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. Ben. Thanks for coming on and uh, I'll have to have you back on here. And uh, as, as, especially as we see things evolve here with all this, I, it's, if nothing else, it's just going to be an interesting ride. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I all mean, right, I think that right, I think right now we're in the clear, by the way, for the pro act, I think that it would have to be on its own merit and I don't think that can happen. So that in a nutshell yeah. would be the, I agree. Where I think it stands. And I by agree. the way, while we were just talking literally a half a minute ago, I, I didn't see it, but an email banner came through saying the FDA just approved the vaccine. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Again, weird timing just before school. And there's a lot of breakthrough cases. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if we know a common uh, gig pe- caster that, uh, that um, uh, well, might have got sick. Uh, and been vaccinated only for two months or a few months or whatever. So, okay. yeah, kind of weird. It's just weird stuff going on. Weird times, man. It is. It tells you all about that. Uh, the ancient curse. May you live in interesting right. times. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, my friends, these are interesting times. And I thank you, uh, all of you, for hanging out with us and everything like that. And thank you, Steve, for hanging out with the crew. So, Courier Nation, you can kind of see how Steve and I could end up spending four hours talking shop at a coffee shop when we got together yesterday. And even today, it would have been so easy for us just to keep going with this conversation. Maybe we could have, maybe we should have, you know, and just make a multi-episode thing out of it. But you know me, you know that I can go down a rabbit hole very easily and probably sell. I was, you know, starting to at different times. Steve was really good at keeping us on track. And I want to thank Steve for just coming on again. Hopefully we can get a chance to do this again. Now, folks, this is important stuff. It really is. I think we've got two choices. And it's not just about our gig work. It's really about anything in life. You can choose to let everybody else dictate your life, or you can choose to be the one to take control. And that's what I love about this opportunity of being an independent contractor. It gives us the chance to take control. We don't have to rely on DoorDash, Uber Eats, Uber Lyft, Grubhub, any of those companies for our success. We can take on our success, create our success ourselves. And as we wrap up today, that's the thing that I really hope to take away from this, that in the end, the secret isn't forcing these guys to be fair. The secret is for you and I to take control. And as we close out this episode, that's what I really encourage you to do. Take control and be the boss.